Okay, so there's a lot going on in uh, the Northern New England chapters having to do with the biotech approach. So I'm gonna be recording on things that have been going on over the last couple of years. Um, and in some ways, this picture here at the start kind of captures it because um, on the left, we love the wild trees and we spend tons of time seeking them out and, and, and grab, uh, catch, grabbing their uh, chestnuts to, to um, raise as seedlings and then plant out in germplasm conservation orchards. So that's part of it. And then the other part of it is the production of the transgenic pollen I'll talk about. That's the key to, to bringing the, um, the blight tolerance to the population. So um, let me see here. Okay. Oops. They're just kind of the subtitle of what I want to say then is oh how we love the chestnut tree and are determined to bring it back. Okay, so uh, just a quick background here. We all pretty much know this, but when we're thinking about bringing back the chestnut tree, American chestnut, why it's so central to the eastern United States, um, all these different things. This is a slide you may have seen before, but in terms of its food value, its wood value, the most important lumber tree of the 1800s, all the wildlife value, even, even fish benefit from the detritus and the, the insect populations that um, the chestnut encourages. So, so we're talking about the keystone species of the eastern U.S. forest, not just any tree. Arguably, it's the most important plant of the east if we can bring that back it's going to be really valuable ecologically as well as uh, for our culture to reinstate our relationship with this tree. So that's, you know, got just a quick background of why do we care? Why are we pouring our hearts into this project? Okay, um, so here's an outline of what I want to talk about um, today. I'm going to talk first of all about this idea of two sides of the same chestnut burr, and then I'm going to talk briefly I'm going to talk briefly about all these topics, just kind of give you an overview of germplasm conservation orchard work. That's real crucial. Um, then the important guidance that the biotech approach here in northern New England has gotten from the scientists at uh, ESF in Syracuse, Environmental Science and Forestry College. We talk, we abbreviated ESF, so that's when I say that, that's what I mean. Lots and lots of help over the years from them. Um, the progress we've made at the University of New England on producing transgenic pollen over the last couple of years, and then applying that <clears throat> pollen in the field last summer, very successful um, uh, across the native range of the chestnut, including in Vermont, uh, Denny and Kendra and, and Hope did some, some nice crossing there um, at the University of Vermont uh, orchard. Um, and now talking about what's emerging, what we're literally directly involved with over the last months and right now uh, creating a common garden experiment uh, here in Maine, but also at ESF and at Meadowview, uh, the chest, um, National Chestnut Headquarters there in Western Virginia. And then briefly summarize all the stuff that's going on this summer and for the rest of 2021, very, very busy. And it's, and it's interesting and exciting because with COVID, of course, so many things have slowed down, but this, uh, this biotech approach under permit from the USDA has continued to, to move forward quite, quite excitingly. So um, definitely lots of constraints put on the process by the permitting uh, restrictions and staying very careful to the permits but at the same time, lots of, lots of progress. Um, so that's, that's quite exciting under these challenging times, both COVID as well as uh, the permits. Okay, so first of all then, this idea of two sides of the same chestnut burr. So here's, here's a visual, um, two sides of the same chestnut burr. What are these two sides that we, we constantly work on? Okay, so the first side, and this ties in with things that have been said um, in Doug's introduction, we, we continue to seek out, propagate, pollinate American chestnut trees because we need nature's genetic diversity. So that um, in, the, in the biotech approach uh, is super important and we spend tons of time finding these wild trees. Um, Mark Meal and, and Dave Lent being um, the most 
successful in finding trees um, in their work in, in Massachusetts. So that's where we um, preserve those, that genetic diversity from those existing mother trees in germplasm conservation orchards. We abbreviate to GCOs and we've got those um, a lot of different places throughout uh, Northern New England and um, quite a few in, in Maine. There's one in, in Georgetown, Maine. And then on the other side of the coin is, is the production of the transgenic blight tolerant pollen. So we need the pollen that has the gene that protects the trees in order to breed with the, um, the wild trees here on the left side of your screen. And so that's, that's, that's the, some of the success we've had at the University of New England. Here's, here's our most uh, prolific seedling producer. These seedlings can produce uh, pollen in, in about a year. And that's crucial because that passes on that, that gene of blight tolerance to the wild trees here on the left side. So that's, that's the two sides working very vigorously on both sides of that um, chestnut burr. Okay. And so you can think about it in terms of the moms being on the left side of your screen, the dads being on the right side of the screen. The chestnut, as most of you know, is, is bisexual, but it doesn't reproduce itself. Um, and so we need uh, couplings in this way. And so we think of the GCOs as being moms because they provide the female flowers and the dads come from the pollen that we're able to um, create in, in, uh, in, in labs both at UNE as well as at ESF in an uh, emerging uh, uh, greenhouse uh, speed breeding uh, setup in, uh, in Meadowview that's just begun. Okay, so what I'm not gonna talk about today, just sort of to help people or orient what I have to say is the back cross breeding program. Um, that's an effort to breed the Chinese chestnut blight tolerance uh, with American chestnuts um, that's an entirely different talk. Um, it, for years and years, it was thought that two or three genes were needed to bring over from the Chinese side. Now from genomics, we know that there's a lot more genes uh, in the Chinese chestnut that, that matter. Um, so so that, that, I'm just putting aside this project. This could be someone else's talk and, and all the things going on in that effort, but, but we're not going to talk about that today. So I just want to be, kind of be clear about that. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about then are these uh, various aspects of the biotech approach. First of all, just a few slides of the GCO effort. Um, so here's, here's one of the many um, GCOs we have across northern New England. This is one in Georgetown, and um, this is a picture from last summer. So the oldest of the GCOs in Maine are now coming on to being five years old, and that's key because then we begin to get significant numbers of female flowers. We, we do our best to treat them well, fertilize them, keep the weeds down. And so in five years, we can begin to get quite a few of these um, GCO uh, saplings to produce uh, female flowers. Uh, in fact, this particular uh, orchard here in Georgetown, Maine, which is south of Bath, if you know, if you've been to Maine, um, began self-pollinating last summer. Um, and so there's a permit that's been um, submitted to USDA to be able to pollinate the, um, the most advanced of these seedlings of uh, this summer with the transgenic pollen. So that's the kind of the cutting edge, the leading edge of the GCO effort in breeding in the blight tolerant shape. Okay, and then so here's, there's gonna be a lot of pictures of, of Doug, very photogenic guy, very, very active in this project, my strong, um, um, comrade in, in this effort. So here is an amazing orchard. If you haven't seen it, you need to go out. This is not a current picture because the trees are bigger now, um, but it's a very cool orchard in central um, Plymouth. Gets the most attention and visibility, I think, of any, any GCO out there. And Doug's doing a great job of keeping these trees uh, very healthy. These will be coming on again in terms of female flowers, possibly even this year, if not for sure, um, summer of 2022. Um, he mentioned, Doug did, the most recent um, GCO effort that was down in Epping just last weekend. And um, so uh, here's how it kind of unfolded with Doug and his backyard um, cache of different chestnut trees of different ages. So 
He did a lot of work in digging them up. He's really good at digging up the trees and successfully relocating them. Um, and so people here are, are, are yet coming to get, get trees, not only for the Epping, but also for some from school um, plantings that, that Tim did, one of the participants in this bottom left corner. And then last Saturday, this was the effort at Epping at the Southeast Land Trust um, and some, some really enthusiastic uh, helpers there from St. Thomas High School. Uh, always important to see younger people involved with this project. Um, seeing the demographics continue to bring in younger people uh, to bring the chestnut back. So this was a great effort last weekend uh, as we continue to find wild trees and plant them in um, different forms of GCOs. And then the last sl slide on this topic of GCOs, again, this is sort of the cutting edge of GCOs. This is a, uh, a sapling, not very big, only about four feet tall in a in our most uh, advanced GCO in Maine, this is in Saco, Maine. Um, and even by la four years out, this is a four-year-old sapling here, looks a little beat up, this is late in the season last year, but it produced a considerable number of female flowers and it was under permit uh, pollinated last year with the transgenic pollen and produced some, some, um, some crosses. You can see those sticks, uh, those white sticks are, are there because the, um, between the, the heavy burrs and the bags and everything and the wind, the, the sapling couldn't keep hold itself up and needed bracing. So, but you can see the maturation can happen quite quickly in our GCOs and that's exciting again, providing this important genetic diversity. Okay, so that's uh, and last slide as we were talking just at the beginning there about how our, how our orchards are, are doing. So here's a picture of an orchard. This one's in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, just the other day and the emergence of the leaves. Very, very exciting moment for chestnut lovers. Um, so we've got a lot of these GCOs, uh, a lot of genetic diversity already captured um, in, in them and um, using different kinds of systems to, uh, to protect the trees. Here we're using tubes to keep the deer from eating the trees under the six foot height. So this tree is is over six feet tall and it's um, this, this is the fourth year beginning the fourth year of this GCO. So you can see how fast they can grow. Very exciting, uh, fast growing tree. Uh, that means it sequesters a lot of carbon. And we, you know, we need to do that. Okay, so that's a, just an important um, element of the project in the preservation, perpetuation of the wild trees. Now I wanna talk about how important the uh, guidance and the science from ESF has been for the progress we've made in, in Northern New England on, on the transgenic approach. So we made, uh, made a couple of trips there back in 2019 um, in order to learn everything we could. And we snacked along the way and this is what it looked like. Um, so <laughs> this is um, a, a picture of a cupcake we forgot to take off of the top of the car. It, it stuck itself. We were really happy in the end. We didn't eat the cupcake because it's had some kind of super glue in it in order to withstand driving down at uh, 70 miles an hour, but being stuck to the car. Uh, but we have a lot of fun along the way, as I think you can um, see, uh, in the, you can see in this picture. Okay, but we made trips to um, to ESF in Syracuse and um, helped out in all the entire process of the transgenic uh, summer seasonality. Um, here's Brian McLean from the Massachusetts chapter here on the left and Doug's in the back. Here's Andy Newhouse and Allison Oaks and Bill Powell. And we did whatever we can to learn the ropes from these, this amazing team of scientists there at ESF. Um, just real briefly on the, the, the lab work they've done there, uh, very careful work uh, testing the transgenic um, American chestnut. Now, these, uh, and they're, they're represented in this column of, of, of seedlings here, uh, mark number B or letter B here in the picture. So what it, just briefly for those that aren't, aren't really versed in this. So wheat gene has been um, introduced to the American chestnut by using a naturally occurring bacteria that is capable and does this in nature. It's called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. 
That means that the transgenic chestnut is more than 99.99% American. You lose no, no American genes by adding the one wheat gene. And by the way, other gene, other plants could have been selected. It's just that the wheat gene, the wheat plant is the most known uh, genomically. It's been studied for so many centuries, really, in so important, obviously, to um, human culture. So that's why that was selected. Um, but many other plants have that gene. The azaleas you see growing right now out all over have the gene. The grass I'm looking out of my window at has the gene. The banana you may have eaten this morning has the gene. The strawberries have the gene. The gene is a very common gene to, uh, to protect itself against the fungal blight. Um, and so that's uh, what is used. And then the blight tolerance level was similar to that of the Chinese in the experiments that have been done at uh, ESF. Um, but the original transgenic trees uh, are clones. And so a lot of effort then has to be put into trying to genetically diversify the population. So much, so much effort and time and thinking is put into how to breed in the wild diversity um, through the GCOs and through finding trees that can bring that um, geographical diversity. All of what I just talked about is written up very uh, carefully in this scientific publication here um, that's listed here on the bottom left. Okay, so the cartoon here I think is great for explaining what the transgenic uh, chestnut does. So you got the um, buster blight on the left, that's a, an accidentally imported blight that came in in the late 1800s, um, uh, native to Asia, but completely unknown to the American chestnut tree. It, it tries to kill the American, American chestnut tree through exuding oxalic acid, and it's very capable of that. If Charlie Chestnut here does not have the gene from wheat. So the gene from wheat provides this enzyme called oxalic, um, oxalate oxidase, or we abbreviate it OXO uh, for short, OXO. So that OXO then provides the shield that um, doesn't kill the buster blight, but deflects it and makes the tree tolerant of the oxalic acid. And then there are these byproducts that come off um, and uh, carbon dioxide and hy hydrogen peroxide. And that's useful for the lab testing we do to see if in fact, if Charlie Chestnut has in, uh, inherited the gene because in the breeding process, less than 50% of the crosses um, actually inherit the gene because of the nature of the, the insertion of the, uh, the wheat gene. Okay, so that in a nutshell is what it's all about and how it works. Okay, so back to ESF. So here, here am I and Doug learning how to do the, the control pollination. And um, you know, these are bags to ensure that we know exactly who the, who the dad is. The pollen comes from, from the lab, the transgenic pollen. It's very carefully administered. And so we're learning that we're up actually up in a, in a lift in this picture, learning how to do the pollination um, back in a couple summers ago. And again, uh, all of this is done very, very uh, thoughtfully and carefully in order to make crosses that the, we know exactly what the uh, uh, father uh, source of, of pollen is. So this is where we learned the ropes, hanging out with the uh, ESF team. And here I say uh, great food and drinks with the young ESF transgenic chestnuts because the reality is uh, our team from Northern New England are, are older than them, but uh, so they're just kind of the demographic thing where we've got, we got Vern here, we got Mark from the, uh, again, part, Vern's part of the ESF team, Mark from the Massachusetts chapter, Andy Newhouse from ESF, myself, uh, Eric Jenkins, um, amazing um, scientist, does some really uh, successful grafting, which is a challenging thing, grafting uh, uh, chestnut trees. Allison Oaks, um, a post, postdoctoral fellow there, uh, again, super scientist and Doug. Um, so, so lots of learning uh, in the field, um, lots of communication since then with ESF to do whatever we've been able to succeed here um, in Northern New England. Okay, so based on that, then we've set off on our own in uh, trying to be in some ways an annex to ESF and do some work, work here following their lead. So I wanna talk next about 
how we produce transgenic pollen at the University of New England. So it began in July of 2019, coming back from a trip from, ES, from ESF. And it all started with just these 12 transgenic seedlings, not much to look at here on the right side of your screen. Um, and we started growing them in a greenhouse in, uh, uh, at the University of New England. And here's Doug being confident that we're gonna succeed. I have to admit, I was not as confident. I kept asking him and Mark, are we gonna be able to do this? Is this gonna be possible to produce pollen under speed beating conditions? And Doug, uh, and, and as always, very enthusiastic. This black thing in the back is a, is a, is a tent to try to uh, grow, grow seedlings uh, in, in a kind of a light chamber with a lot of shiny surfaces. And I can tell you that did not work. It was way too dry. I dismantled that. So it just kind of illustrates that we've been doing a lot of experimenting along the way, continue to experiment, trying to figure out how to produce pollen under um, speed breeding conditions, under high intensity lights, high intensity fertilization. Uh, I, I'll say right out, it's not easy. We've had a lot of uh, drawbacks, but we've had some success as well. So from these seedlings, that were originally planted at ESF in March of 2019, and then we inherited them in July of that year. By November of 2019, we had our first catkins. So this is our first of those 12 uh, seedlings. And as it was a, kind of a birthday uh, moment in November of 2019, the first of November where we saw our first catkins uh, beginning to form, very exciting moment. and then. Uh, three weeks later, we got our first pollen. So we've been producing pollen then since late November, about a year and a half now. Um, off and on, as I'll explain, it doesn't come consistently for various reasons. And you, you're wondering probably why is it red? Because the LED lights that we use in the internal um, uh, process uh, make the pictures look red. That's the red part of the spectrum that produces good uh, leafage on plants. So plants, pictures taken under the LED lights are always going to look red. So that was an exciting moment. Here's another one. Here's, a, here's a, a seedling that produced tons of pollen. So they vary a lot from seedling to seedling. This one, you can imagine, uh, uh, is producing a lot of uh, pollen that we can store up and, and then use in the field come, come July. Um, and here's uh, Doug explaining how we do it. It's a little hard to see here, but we use microscope slides. Again, this is a technique that was developed over the years at ESF to store pollen on microscope slides. Um, and this has become the law of the land. This has been a successful technique we used um, throughout the native range last summer. And uh, so it looks like this up close. So we collect the pollen, all this yellow stuff here you see at the top represents a tremendous amount of pollen. Pollen grains are really, really small. <laughs> they're um, uh, it just, you know, barely, they're really not visible to the naked eye. You have to look at them under a microscope. I'll show you a picture here in a second. So this is how we store them up and we cluster them in groups of four when we gather them off of the seedlings. And then we put them in these microscope vials here on the bottom, uh, four per, per microscope vial. And it's, you can see labeled with a uh, vial number and uh, the, the, the uh, WA27 is one of those seedlings. And this is Darling 58 uh, 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 plus, plus means that it's, it's transgenically positive. It has a wheat gene. 18 means that it was a, a seedling um, that was harvested in 2018. And then, so we have all of these vials and we're now up to about 715 vials that we've produced at the University of New, Eng U New England. We used about half of those last summer. We used the rest of those this summer to continue to uh, breed with, um, with, with trees out, out in nature and in our, in our orchards. All of this gets stored in, a, um, in freezers that are negative 80 Celsius. That's about, about negative 125 Fahrenheit, super cold. And we also have a backup generator in case the power goes out because this is really, really valuable, tremendous amount of effort it takes to, to do this. And, it, um, and then we need to test that pollen. Now, this, this is not human sperm. This is, these are pollen grains. 
um, under a microscope at 100 times magnification. So you can see how small they are. And what we're looking for when we test the pollen is the uh, pollen putting out these tubes. This tube is crucial. The tube indicates that the pollen grain is viable. And this is the tube that it would use if it were in the field to pollinate the female flower and to reach the oval. And um, even some of this, you can kind of see this is actually literally the DNA of uh, the uh, pollen grain here with the tube here on the left. So they put out the, the, the DNA and that's how it uh, couples with the female flower. So we test it with, a, with an agar sugar solution um, in the lab and that replicates what the female flower puts out in order to signify that it's ready for pollination. So this is a happy moment from the lab that we know our pollen is good. We need to do a lot more of this in the next few weeks because uh, this was a picture from last year that we did it with pollen that we sent out. And now we need to do the same thing with the pollen we stored over the last year. So a little bit of a, um, um, a nervous moment until we do our agar sugar testing to make sure that our pollen is viable. We've used the same technique as last year. We hope it's the same, but we don't know. Just a couple of quick graphs. I don't wanna do too much science, but I just wanna kind of give you a sense that there's a lot of ups and downs and trials and tribulations in the production of of the light tolerant pollen. So this is uh, across the X axis here in your picture are days. And it gives you a sense of um, once you sow <clears throat> a seed that has the transgenic, um, um, the transgenic uh, gene, <clears throat> what happens over time? Well, typically <clears throat> it'll take about a year, ballpark a year for that seedling to produce pollen. And so throughout this first <clears throat> one first day, here on the left <clears throat> through day 323 for this particular example seedling, no, almost no pollen. And then it can, pre can produce quite dramatically. And so you've got, you know, on the, on the y-axis, you have uh, how many pollen slides are produced per day. So you can see <clears throat> about one pollen slide per day. <clears throat> excuse me. So that's a good amount of pollen. But then what you see, <clears throat> excuse me, my somehow throat is... Okay. So then you see these troughs. So this is very typical in pollen production. The pests and pathogens are always lurking and there's a whole variety of different things. <clears throat> I think we've identified six or eight different pests and pathogens that are in our lab, that are in our growth chamber, that are in our greenhouse, that are always there to um, beat back the health of the seedlings. Um, and you, you know, again, tremendous amount of effort put into this. It's not just at our, uh, in our labs and greenhouses, it happens all over. Um, and it's, it's partly a product of the fact that you need a year or two or more to produce pollen. So you can't clean the greenhouse out 100% and start from scratch because you can see this particular um, seedling is at, at day 547, you know, a year and a half in, it's producing pollen. So you need to keep it alive for years in order to get the pollen. Um, so it's this sort of roller coaster uh, challenge where pollen comes up and the pets win and temporarily, and then we figure out what they're doing and try to how to, how to beat them back under the constraints of doing it indoors. So that's also a challenge because you can't do as much pest control indoors um, at a university as you might do out in the field. So, so this is a major part of the trials and tribulations that I think is captured here in this, in this particular chart. Um, the other very interesting is the only other chart I'll show you, a very interesting part of the effort to produce pollen is that it's, it's extremely concentrated amongst a few seedlings. All, all transgenic seedlings don't produce pollen. Um, it varies a lot. Some are, are capable of moving through this speed breeding process faster than others. And this is a chart that shows that. So in fact, of our original 24 seedlings we started with, I showed you a picture of 12. We got 12 more later from ESF. So we've been working with uh, 24 seedlings for most of the time. We've begun some new ones this year, but for most of the time of, of trying to produce pollen, it's been these 24 seedlings. Two of the 24 have produced half of all the pollen that we've been able to produce. So you can see just two, two seedlings here have produced 
um, over 500 slide, pollen slides, which is a tremendous amount of pollen. Each slide can pollinate at least 10 or more female flowers. So, so that's a lot of pollen. Other ones have produced, but nowhere near as much. And the majority here uh, depicted on the right side of your graph have not produced at all. Well, why? Um, two reasons. One is just that whatever their genetics are, and we don't know how the genetics vary between the ones on the left and the ones on the right, but for whatever it is, these gen the genetics here will not, um, will not produce pollen, even though we give them exactly the same treatment. And the other thing about it, again, related to genetics, is that these here on the, on the left are more susceptible to the pests and pathogens. So most of these have died, have never made it to pollen production because the pests and pathogens win. So it's very interesting to, to look at the variety. You need the, you know, one of the lessons of this is you need to plant a lot of seedlings if you want pollen from a variety of different sources. Remember back to what I said earlier about how we need genetic diversity. We mostly get our genetic diversity from the field, from other trees out there and in the GCLs, but there is also some genetic diversity as well, even across this x-axis in the form of the um, different lineages of the transgenic. So in fact, all of these seedlings here represented are the grandchildren of the original clone of the Darling 58. So these are, these are two generations away from the or original clone. And we're working now with the third generation that we harvested last October of 2020. Okay, so here then the last on this topic of pollen production is kind of an exciting new moment in our lab here at, at UNE. So what we tried to do this year is see, can we speed up even further the production of pollen? So this is a seedling here in the top left that we gathered around October 1st last year, like we gather all of the um, wild uh, seeds when they became, become mature in the field around more or less October 1st, maybe late September. So this was gathered in, in Maine. And this is one of the ones we pollinated with the transgenic pollen. So here's how it looked at, uh, at December 27th. And by May 4th, just the other day, it was already beginning to put out a significant number of catkins, not only on this branch, but on other branches. So that's just over a little four months from, from sowing the seed here on the left to catkin production on the right with hopes that it will produce pollen this year. So this has not ever been done before that you can produce pollen within the same calendar year in order to speed up the generational um, effect of pollen production. So if we can get this, then we can have some, some third, third generation of what we call T3 pollen for use um, next summer. So not many, this is the most advanced of the, the few dozen we tried to do this with this year, but it's an exciting moment. We and keep it alive, keep the pests and pathogens at bay. Um, this is what that seedling looks like now, um, the same day it pretty much that this picture was taken on the left. So you can see, you can grow them really, really fast in the speed breeding intern, uh, indoor conditions. Um, and um, so that's kind of an exciting moment in our uh, UNE lab. Okay, so that was the first of uh, four of our seven topics um, and, and I'm going to talk about what we did in the field last summer and what's been going on with the harvesting of the transgenic uh, uh, crosses uh, as of last summer throughout the native range. But I'm going to pause right now uh, and see what questions and comments people have of what we've talked about so far. So are there any questions and things that people would like to chime in on, clarifications? Oops. Sorry, um, uh, how are things going so far? I wanna make sure you're all awake. Looks like you are. I see your pictures now because I didn't see you before. Anything people wanna say um, at this point? I can't see the chat. So I don't know if there's anything in the chat, Doug, that people want answers to. Anybody wanna chime in on anything we've talked covered, covered so far before we move on to the, to the rest of the presentation? Okay, I, uh, Brian McLean here. I have a quick question. Um, what did you do different to get the four month turnaround time for the uh, fast pollen production that was different from the previous? Trial? Yeah, great, great question, Brian. Nothing really different, just trying to learn from experience and figure things out and not make 
as many mistakes, but it, you make tons of mistakes along the way. There's just no way around it. Um, partly because, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm an ecologist, I'm not a nursery man. I wish, in fact, we have a nursery man on the board in Maine who just joined our board. He's growing all of our wild um, offspring in, uh, for our GCOs and for, um, for sale in the main chapter. He's grown over a, a thousand of them and they look great and he knows what he's doing. I don't know as much of what I'm doing. Um, so it's a trial and error, lots of emails, lots of con consulting with ESF and many other people. Um, and, and I made some big mistakes this year. In a nutshell, I tried to push the seedlings way too fast with too much light too early on. So they can't in January, early January, they can't handle light intensity. They're not ready yet. You know, so seedling, you know that chestnuts use this, this stratification kind of timeout period in winter between harvesting in the fall and, and uh, seedling production in the spring. That's how they naturally uh, grow themselves. So you, they need a timeout and they can't be pushed too hard. So that's one of the major um, lessons to not push them, give them less light, give them a, a light that's gonna increase with of intensity and length um, in January and into February. That particular seedling I showed you in the previous question was able to handle the light, but most of them cannot and they died. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's more failures than success. I think that's absolutely how, how science works. Um, but, but it's pretty cool if we can, if we can do it at all, it'll be the first time that it has happened that we can produce pollen the same year. And then we would be poised to try to not replicate the mistakes this year we made uh, and do a better job next year with a greater range of, of um, genetic diversity represented. Um, so if we can get to T4 and T5 pollen generations that far away from the original clone, that would be tremendous for, for, to, uh, to our quest of producing a, a blight tolerant chestnut that has the geographical uh, representation of the native range. Tom, I see uh, Steve Wood has his hand up. Please. Go ahead, Steve. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, please. There thank you, you Pardon. Thank you, Pardon. Still not quite good at this. Um, I, I apologize. I may have missed something, but you've been using the phrase pollen slide as a unit of measurement. And I, I, I don't understand. I mean, it, it was on the y axis of the graph. What, what, is, it, what is the unit? I, th I thought it was just a, a slide that you could see under the microscope. But I'm probably being stupid. No, no. Though. Okay, so let me go back. So let me see where that slide is, just to be clear. So these, this is a, these <laughs> across the top are the are the pollen slides, and so this is a technique that ESF developed in order to capture transgenic pollen during the entire calendar year. Of course, we only needed it for about a week, right in the middle of yeah. July, when the wild trees are ready. Uh, so the other, you know, 51 weeks of the year we're trying to capture the pollen indoors and store it, right? And so then we take, we thaw it and take it out to the field and we use it and so it works. So that's what I mean by uh, pollen slide. And I'm sorry, you... I, I, I did understand that you describe it very well. It was just seeing it as a unit of measurement on a y-axis on right. a graph. Why, that why I, do it that I way? I missed because something, it just means a whole it, it means enough pollen to make one of those slides, right? That's, is that right? Correct. And then that, okay. we do an inventory and then we think about, oh, how much do we have of each kind? Who do we exactly. send it out to? What's going on at, um, you know, at the Smithsonian land in Virginia that Tom Saeli takes the pollen out to, to pollinate. So, we, so we, we use it as a unit of say, how much do we have? and who gets what. And this will become a little bit more meaningful in a, in a moment when we talk about what we're calling now the, the common garden experiment, where and we so use this pollen to, um, to pollinate wild trees throughout the range last summer and create this uh, common garden experiment um, uh, uh, orchard uh, system that we're putting in place uh, this summer. Tom, are you able to see uh, raised hands or am I the only one that can see that? Um, if they're at, if they're towards the top of the screen, I can. Okay, Brian Clark. Brian Clark. Brian, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and direct. Um, 
call on people, Doug, it'd be easier. Thank you. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, something that I'm wondering, listening to the, the how you're describing the acceleration techniques, it, it sounds like you're sort of selecting, uh, maybe inadvertently selecting trees that can tolerate the acceleration techniques you're using. And I'm wondering if that's a, a concern that you're, you're artificially selecting for a particular trait and maybe carrying, picking out, narrowing your, your genetic diversity that way. Yeah, it's a great question. Something we've been pondering, Brian, um, and we don't know the answer. Um, we, what we should do and what we've been beginning to think about is to look at the genetics and the genomics of the of the seedlings that do produce versus the ones that don't produce to see if there's any difference. Can we find anything genomically that makes them different? Because we don't know why some are better able to withstand the speed breeding and the pests and pathogens. But it's, it's something to be, to, to look out for. Um, a little bit of a, a, um, a sort of a, a remedy to that is the fact that there are a variety of, of seedlings that produce some pollen. Uh, some, there's a, as I said, a, a few will produce the majority, but the, there are a bunch that produce some. So we are getting a greater range of genetic diversity out of that. Um, but it's definitely something to look at. In it, you know, yeah, your time, think about the time contrast. A chestnut tree is a multi-century tree. Um, sits in the understory for decades, typically, and what we're trying to do is uh, collapse it into uh, more of a human scale to try to move the process along. But it's something very much worth uh, looking at uh, as we move forward to see if there is anything about that. Um, as we get more uh, growth chambers involved, like I mentioned, ESF, last year they didn't produce much transgenic pollen. This year they're going to produce more. Uh, we got We keep checking with each other. Uh, there's always downtimes, uh, and they didn't do well last year. Fortunately, our lab did really well, and then tr and then TACF and Meadowview is starting to produce pollen. So we're going to have a greater range um, in the future that will um, just by by the diversity of locations help to overcome that potential problem. I know my experience with breeding orchards uh, is it is just naturally a, a real wide range of uh, these characteristics with trees when they when they blow bloom you know there's a wide spread in my in my orchard uh, with uh, there's now 14 or 15 different lines uh, there's multiple week range and when things blossom uh, uh, and trees that don't blossom at all others that are very prolific I just yeah. Uh, yeah I understand that the drive to get things done quickly and it makes good sense and just hope that we don't lose sight of needing to, to include the ones that don't go so quickly in the yeah. overall effort on long yeah. term. Yeah, and, and it has been a debate that when we when we set up our summer pollinations last summer and then this summer, well, how much do we put as many different types of pollen as we can on each mother tree or do we put one kind of pollen on one tree, therefore we can have replicates uh, across the range, you know, so that that debate right there is part of what we're trying to decide and what you're saying would be a nod in the direction of putting the, the greatest range of pollen per tree to great to, to bring in that genetic diversity. But it's a great question. Doug, should we should we move on to the final uh, few slides and then open it up for even a broader discussion. Okay, good. All right, so go ahead to where we were. Just again, a couple more points to raise here. Um, and so um, I wanna talk about what we did last uh, summer, okay? And so this is what it looked like in Maine last July, and that's Doug. Again, Doug heavily featured in these pictures, been so so involved in this and appreciate his, his, his uh, effort so much. So here he is on the left. This is the first time we went up in the lift. He went up on the lift. I was a little bit nervous about it. This tree here on the left is about 50 feet tall. <laughs> and I was kind of wondering about it, but it ends up being lots of fun. 
and you can see, I think it might be the same tree. No, it's actually a different tree on the, on the right. Um, and you can see the pollination bags again to control so you know exactly who the dad is. Um, so this is what it looked like here. And it same thing happened in six other places across the native range last summer um, to, uh, to produce these transgenic crosses. Um, so in, in the Maine portion, in, in Maine, state of Maine, uh, we, we had a couple of people with masks up in the trees and we had a guy, this is actually the president of the uh, Maine chapter, Al Faust. So we were calling down the crosses we were making, which pollen we were using, how many burrs. So we were keeping really good, we had very, very detailed records of that. And he was writing all that stuff down uh, and then eventually transferred to an Excel uh, spreadsheet. Uh, here again, back to the slide thing. So this is what it looks like in the field up close. So you get take your slide that you produced in the lab and stored in the freezer out to the field. And you can see the, the pollen grains on the slide. And then this is a receptive female flower. So that's how we do it. And then we uh, put the bag back on. You can see um, uh, pollen and catkins from the tree here, but it very rarely does it pollinate itself. So then we know who the dad is because we can test for that transgenic gene um, uh, once the once the burr is is uh, heart is ripened by by October first. Okay, and you get into a lot of bags, tons and tons of bags, and we keep good records here, detailed records. So I'm up in the tree doing these crosses um, last summer in Maine. And last summer then we, we did our pollination in, in Maine, but we also sent pollen to six different places. So University of Vermont and, Vermont and Kendra and Denny and Hope did that work. And then the, our good folks at Meadowview and Tom Sayali at the Smithsonian and Jim McKenna at Purdue. In our work, we produced 1500 uh, fertile nuts from our transgenic crosses and Alan Nichols did, did some on his land and then ESF did over a thousand. So then across all of these, we produced over 5,000 uh, fertile crosses, which is, which is a major step forward in terms of quantity and geographical diversity. Uh, but then we needed to test them and, and less than half will inherit the gene. Um, for, our, for our testing, we got 47%, so pretty close to half, statistically within half so of these, um, these here I show you from Maine, 1500, we got 47% of them inherited the, the transgenic uh, um, wheat gene. So that's what came out of last summer. And then we had uh, more fun in the fall in October, right after harvesting, we had a shucking party here up in Maine. So we got some chestnut trees in the background. We got a chestnut uh, guitar here on the left. And we've got nice representation. Again, Brian from the Massachusetts chapter, and we've got uh, Kurt and Carol from, from your chapter and some others from the main chapter and Doug from, from your chapter all working together to do our shucking. And here's uh, Kurt and Carol doing some mighty fine trans transgenic burr shucking. And it's a big job. And as we continue to escalate this this process of increasing nut production across the, uh, the native range, gonna be more and more work. So it'll be more work this summer. So we gotta you know, keep figuring how to, how to be more efficient um, with the work and volunteers are, are tremendous. Uh, and so we're so thankful for them. And so, yeah, in lots of detail, you see the bag here, it keeps track of exactly what the cross is. Even we even kept track of which pollination bag uh, the particular burr uh, was in. So we have really, really good records of, of all of that. And then another party a little bit later the next month, again, um, Kurt and, and Carol were there along with others from, from your chapter. Uh, Chris Leesk is in the background somewhere uh, doing some of this. And what they're doing then is, is sampling the, the nut, sampling the cotyledon tissue of the nut. And then we test it for the presence of the oxo transgenic um, gene. So all of these, all of these little bowls here uh, have uh, test tubes in them waiting to see the results of the test. And inside those, inside here, if you look more closely, is what's is, is the test. So in this particular little mini test tube 
is a solution, solution that has the oxalic acid. Remember, that's what the fungal blight uses to, to kill the chestnut tree. And the, this piece of cotyledon tissue is taken off of that, off of the nut, off the bottom part of the nut. We don't, we don't touch the embryo, the, so that's the living part of the nut. And then we ended up growing out this seedling in the greenhouse. So the fact that it turned black, um, going back to that cartoon picture I showed you before, in, indicates that the tissue is uh, emitting hydrogen peroxide. And that means it is reacting to the oxalic acid and it's, uh, it's got the G. So this is how we can test very precisely that we know the mom, we know the dad, and we can make some very, very precise crosses. Um, so that's what I just described, subjected to oxalic acid like the fungal blight uses. Um, and it turns it, it turns it dark. Okay, and it's very precise. Okay, and then so here's the contrast. So another example of that, just to see what we're doing in this testing process that we do, you know, the November, December with all of our harvest. The one on the left turns black. It has the, has the gene. The one on the right does not have the gene, but it's still really valuable because we're planting out these, these pears in our orchard this summer. And uh, so this is a matched, we, we can make matched pairs. We can make, uh, we can plant um, the transgenic and the full sibling non-transgenic side by side in the field. And that's what we're gonna be doing in this common garden experiment. Okay, and let me talk briefly about what's going on with that uh, common garden experiment um, at, um, we're, so we're using all of these genes. So we've gathered then uh, nuts from all seven of these locations where the uh, transgenic pollination went on last summer. And then we're, uh, this is a lot of data, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but this is a table that Jared Westbrook, our uh, director of science put together, um, where he compiled all the different crosses we made last summer amongst those seven locations. And those are represented in the top rows, you know, so you can see, a, uh, transgenic cross in the top row made at Meadowview and some other ones, Virginia, that's done by the Smithsonian, Tom Sayoli. Here are some nuts that uh, Kendra, Denny, and Hope produced. Here's a bunch we made in Maine and at ESF and in Purdue. Okay, and then we got some other, what we're calling controls, um, some, some F1 50-50 crosses with the Chinese, some pure Chinese and some hybrids. And we're planning all of these out in three different locations, the exact same composition will be planted out at ESF, at TACF, at Meadowview, and in our, our permitted site in Cape Elizabeth um, to see how they do and see um, what, what the performance is of the transgenic against the variety of different controls, including their full sib non-transgenic uh, counterparts that could have been produced within the same pollination bag but did not inherit the transgenic gene. So that's a very exciting next step in this process. So I, I have to give um, th many thanks to my students at the University of New England who did so much work over the previous months in planting out the uh, seedlings in our greenhouses and keeping track, filling out the aluminum tags for each one of the plants. Could not have made the progress we've made without lots and lots of um, science student help. And again, the red lights of the LEDs. So this is what um, one of our two greenhouses look like at UNE. Um, and it's a new greenhouse. I had never used it before. And it taught me a lesson that if you use a new greenhouse, you, you find vastly fewer pests and pathogens and you grow much better seedlings indoors. So this greenhouse is doing much better than my other old greenhouse that I've used year and year, year after year. So we have to do something about that next year. We're not gonna just plant it out. We're gonna really flesh it out uh, to, to get rid of um, the legacy of pests and pathogens in the other one. Um, so lessons learned all the way along. But these, this is, uh, these are primarily uh, the, the results of crosses to transgenic crosses that'll be planted in the common garden experiment here in Maine. Um, there's also a few wild ones, wild uh, seedlings that we got from Mark Meal um, uh, as well, but primarily these are transgenic. And this is what our site that is um, where we're going to do our, uh, trans our common garden experiment site. 
uh, here in Maine that where the application has been made to USDA. It's about one acre in size um, to, and it would be surrounded by fence to keep the deer from, from getting in there, eight foot tall fence. Uh, did some soil sampling in this orchard, very nice soil profile, just kind of ideal chestnut soil. So I think it should be a really good site. We've been growing a variety of different chestnuts on this land in Cape Elizabeth at different locations for years now. So we know it produces, it has its own wild cheap trees, but it also produces uh, offspring and has a GCO that are, that are doing fantastic. So we know it's a good site for chestnuts. We prepared this site uh, by burning it just to see how that could contribute to trying to reduce some of the hayfield um, uh, grasses a little bit. And this is the landowner of the land. It's uh, in the Sprague family. And as, a, as you know, so crucial to get a landowner buy-in. We're gonna restore the chestnut. We're gonna need lots of people like Seth that are uh, part of our uh, uh, partnership that are offering their land, that are willing to help plant trees. Um, so that's absolutely crucial to our success. So here's again, our, our little burn off a couple of weekends ago to prepare the site. Um, we'll continue to mow it as well to get ready for planting in a couple of weeks, as soon as the threat of frost is passed. Okay, so that's what's going on in the common garden experiment. And then the last thing I wanna say real briefly is what we're doing right now and what's going on for the rest of 21. 2021 and lots of stuff. And this is where volunteers are needed um, to get the job done um, as we move forward. So tons of activities now through the first part of next month. So basically in the next, the next 30 days, what are we up to? Lots of stuff. We have to send leaf samples from all of our seedlings that we have indoors um, to Jared and uh, for genomic analysis. And we want, what the point of it is, is to find out which of the seedlings have the least um, uh, overlap with the original founder tree uh, in the uh, transgenic insertion. So we wanna diversify away from that Ellis tree and find which, which seedlings do that the best other than that single gene um, that um, comes over from, from wheat and protects. Uh, continuing to develop and prepare the common garden site, laying out the uh, distribution of seedlings, going to be five feet uh, in between uh, trees in the row, 10 feet between the rows, alternating transgenic seedlings and controls, uh, keep the seedlings happy, deal with the pests, continue to push them and harden them off by opening the windows, by using the fans and kind of make them more and more tough. In, in the greenhouses as we transition to the out, outside planting. We probably about 700 seedlings here in Maine. Um, and then continuing the production of transgenic pollen um, and testing, as I mentioned before. So that's all going on in the next month. Oh, then the next major uh, task is GCO maintenance. We need to continue to monitor our our seedlings and our GCOs, mowing, weeding, repairing the aluminum tags that may have fallen off or broken. We have backup data and inventories and Excel sheets, but the wind will blow it off or something. So some, you always got to check and see maybe, a, maybe an animal pulled off a tag in keeping the uh, update inventory um, uh, accurate. And we have many, many different GCOs to do that at. Um, in June, uh, is when we organize our transgenic pollen that we have frozen and figure out who gets what, ship it on dry ice to probably around eight different sites, uh, it, with including some new sites that will be pollinated for the first time down in Georgia and in South Carolina. So expanding the geographical range and the South Carolina is actually very interesting because these are uh, saplings that have demonstrated um, a tolerance of the Phytophthora root rot. So we'll be blending those saplings that have that tolerance for the, the, the root rot with ones that have, which has breeding it with pollen that has the uh, transgenic wheat, wheat gene uh, blight tolerance. So that's, that's an exciting next step. And then placing all over the control pollination bags on the, on the female flowers that we want to pollinate in July 
before there's any open pollination. We did a good job with that last year. That's why we got 70 or 47% success. Uh, in, in, uh, in Maine last year, we put our pollination bags on as soon as we can identify the female flowers. Wanna do that again this year. And then in mid-July, we're doing pollinations of the uh, female flowers. And if you do it twice or even three times, you get a much higher success rate. It takes more time, gotta rent the, the lift if we're going up to the big trees, easier to do in the GCOs. That's why the G one of the reasons why the GCOs are, are really valuable. Can You can reach them much easier by the ground or just the ladder compared to having to rent the lift. So that's happening in mid-July. And then finally, um, late September, again, the cycle continues as last, we did in, last, in 2020, harvesting um, the uh, pollinated nuts as soon as we can, uh, and then shucking parties, and then testing parties for the gene inheritance. And so the seasonality and the annual cycle continues with this year with, with greater geographical representation, uh, greater quantity, and um, uh, both in terms of pollen type as well as mother trees. And so that's, that's what we're up to, yeah. Um, so we lots of fun on this transgenic chestnut restoration mission. Please join us. Uh, we have a good time all along the way, as you can tell here. And, um, and so here we are with our uh, transgenic uh, seedling greenhouse at the University of New England. So this will be then, these will be the seedlings outplanted in the next, within the next month, creating New England's first transgenic chestnut orchard. That um, orchard we're gonna put in, in, uh, in uh, New Cape Elizabeth, Maine, will be the first time we put the transgenics in the ground in, in New England. So it's a very exciting moment. So while they await that, I await your further comments and questions. And I, I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to stop sharing and open it back up to. Yeah, we're all, we're all muted, Tom. So yeah, now I can the, the, uh, uh, Sorry, go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say that since we're muted, we, we can't really give you a round of applause, but that's great. And I just let me interject here that we're going to take about um, we're gonna come back for our board meeting in 45 minutes. So at noon, so this is gonna give people who want to ask questions and stay on with Tom 45 minutes to do so. Those that want a lunch or a bathroom break, um, you, you can come back at noon. The board meeting is not gonna be nearly as exciting. We're going over some items. It, it's definitely open to all members, but bottom line is you have 45 minutes to ask Tom questions. And if we can't get to all of them, we can get back to you later. But Tom, I guess if you can see us, thank you. We can all give you a round of applause. Very, very good job. Thank you. you Tom, okay? I have a question. I have a question. Uh, where else uh, are they doing what you're doing at the, at the University of New England? Um, yeah, so do you, which part of it, Tom, because well, again, whole, you've got whole, this sort of two, two sides of the burr, right? We've got the wild and then we've got the indoor production of the transgenic pollen. Well, what, what you're doing, the indoor production. Indoor, the, indoor, yeah. So the originator of that technique is ESF in Syracuse. So that's, again, where we learned, learned the technique by visiting and lots of emails and, and Zooms and along the way. Um, it's very interesting very quickly about that. So when, when we jumped in in 2019, and uh, when I say we, it was the trips that Doug and I and, and Brian McLean and Mark Meal made, and we were approaching Bill Powell and Andy Newhouse and said, hey, can we try, we've got a growth chamber, we've got a greenhouses here at UNE, can we try, can we, can we try to replicate what you're doing? And they kind of thought about it a little while and they said, yeah, you know what, as an insurance policy, Let's go ahead and do that. Let's let's give you some only you know a few nuts. Started with twelve seedlings, and then we got another twelve nuts later. So still we're just working with those original twelve, uh, twenty-four, and again we're just beginning to get a little bit of catkin production on the next generation. 
Uh, but they, they specifically use the word insurance and uh, very interesting because as it turned out um, for 2020, ESF had a very, very poor uh, production of, of, of pollen. And so our UNE pollen was sent out all over and it was lucky we had a second source. Um, so, so, that, so that's where it started. I think from what I hear from ESF, and again, there'll be a lot of conversations in the next few weeks as we consolidate what our inventories are like. I think they're, they're definitely doing much better this year. So they're gonna, they're gonna have other, other kinds of um, uh, crosses uh, and trans, uh, transgenic uh, pollen sources uh, this year. Uh, so it'll be uh, more parallel between our lab and their lab. Um, so that's the only, that's as far as it exists right now. Tom. Uh, Meadowview has a new uh, setup that they've learned from us, how we do it, and they've set up their, uh, and they, this, this has just only been a month. So there's very, very early on, and they, there's no way they're going to have pollen ready by uh, July. So maybe they could be successful by next year. Right. I wish them all the luck in the world. We need as much diversity as possible for, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so, Tom, I'm going to uh, uh, two things. Just remind folks that uh, ESF did did not send the transgenic uh, seedlings home with you until you had an APHIS permit from the government. It was very tightly controlled. And uh, I know Yuri and Ina have both had their hands up. So, either one of you, please chip in. Ina or Yuri, are you still? Uh, I saw a hand come up. I just applauded the presentation. I didn't have a question. The three questions are Brian Clark, Brian McLean, and Louisa D. Yep. Um, so yeah, who wants to go? I don't know who was first, but amongst Brian, Brian, and, and Louisa, please chime in. I think I might be quickly um, set aside, so I'll go fast. I'm uh, just a, at the extreme surface of all this. I'm Steve Wood's wife. Um, and we are thinking about a lot of ways to use our land in future. So this is of intense interest. We're sort of shrinking the apples. Anyway, one of the, I, I was much um, alarmed as I think intention, what the intention was by a page in the Fedco catalog uh, from this past winter, where there's two sides of this uh, question presented, the question of genetically altered chestnuts. And I just, I'm really asking for some reading about that because I think it's a bit lengthy to reply to it now, but on one side of the page, there are these dark connections to lumber companies and comparisons to GE corn that kills um, monarch butterflies and all the unknowns that will come back to bite us and oh my God. And, um, and the Fedco suggests, uh, waiting two or 300 years before we put these out in the world. And, uh, and so I just want to know what I should read to really get bore into these questions, because it sounds like 99.9999% uh, American I, is a pretty good is a pretty I might good be able to speed, speed things up by answering that. And it would be that uh, we applaud that both you and your husband have just joined our, our chapter and TACF. And I think the material that will soon be coming, the, the, four times a year magazine and all the back and forth, okay. you're going to hear a lot about it. We can't really go into all of that. No, I know that. I was looking yeah. for references, not for wow. not for a full answer. It's yeah. going to be filling up your mailbox. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would, I would, I would direct you, Louisa, it's a great question. And, you know, the science has to be very, very careful. I would direct you to the environmental science and forestry chestnut restoration website. Okay. At ESF in Syracuse. Um, and specifically, they've submitted a 400 page petition to the US government, to USDA specifically, uh, to yeah, yeah. regulate. Yeah, that's all in here and it's seen as very sinister. Yeah, okay. Right. So, all right, thank you. I won't take any more no, of your expert no, but time. It's, it's worth noting that a lot of testing has been done as to whether the, whether the American chestnut with the extra gene performs any different in the field. And um, all the evidence suggests that it, it performs exactly the same. The mycorrhizal soil relationships are the same. The bee pollen uh, activity is the same. The tadpole use of the detritus is the same and on and on and on. So um, yeah, so testing has been done, continuing to, to do, when we're planning them out this summer in this sort of common garden experiment, it'll be yet another test 
how do they perform against all the other variations in, in chestnuts. So we can continue to monitor that, monitor that very carefully. Yep, it's a really, really important thing. Oh, and I think, I think uh, uh, Kendra thankfully has put in the chat a link to um, some materials, excellent materials uh, at, on the TACF, the, Meadow, the, uh, the National Chestnut Foundation website where you could read up on the, the science that has gone on uh, behind the scenes in making sure that the, the transgenic is, is no different than the wild and then the wild tree, except for the one thing, which is to protect the tree from the uh, accidentally imported Asian fungal blight. Great question. Great, great, very important, Luisa. Luisa, thank you. Brian and Brian. I think Brian Clark was first. No, uh, your hand was up before mine. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, so uh, actually it's um, my, what I wanted to say was actually in response to something you had uh, mentioned, which was the concern that we're, with the speed breeding you're selecting for, you know, fast pollination uh, uh, seedlings, and you might be skewing the genetics that way. But what I wanted to point out is that's one of the reasons we're planting all these GCOs, because that's our ace in the hole that, you know, at least the final crossing, there will be no um, selection on on speed breeding. Those guys are going to go into the forest. So, um, I you know, although uh, there is concern early on, I think the the plan is that you know by the time we do the final outcrossings with these GCOs, uh, any sort of selection bias will be you know uh, reduced. That's it. Yeah, it, it's worth noting you know, when we think about GCOs, we have a dozen or more mother trees represented in each of these GCOs. So it is remarkably diverse what a GCO can represent in terms of the native range. So that's, that's helping a lot um, to, yeah, and we'll continue to push that idea of capturing as much of the, the native gen uh, genetic diversity. That's where I think that two sides of the, of the the chestnut burr. Um, <laughs> Brian Clark. Yeah. Um, just wondering. That this is probably a broader question than what just what you've been doing. Is do you know if there if there's any equivalent testing or starting uh, with uh, back cross trees rather than native native uh, pure Americans at this point. Uh, you mean crossing the transgenic pollen with with the hybrids? Right. That that is going on at at Meadowview. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they did any last summer. They may have. Can they get the pollen and they do what they want to do with it? I just sent it to them on dry ice, and happily it arrives with dry ice still intact. So we know that worked. Um, but I know there is some of that going on um, at at Meadowview. Okay, thanks. I didn't realize there was this much stuff going on that you guys were being this productive. It's good to hear. Yeah, it's it's been it's been very exciting. Again, COVID gets in the way. The permits don't tell us what we can do, what we can't, mostly can't do. Yet making progress is very exciting. Feeling like we can continue to to move in in the positive direction towards chestnut restoration. Mark Meal has his hand up. Unmute, Mark. Yes, I, my question is, uh, are you, did I understand correctly that you are actually going to mix wild Americans with transgenic in GCOs? So you're gonna have open pollination between wild Americans no, and no, no, uh, transgenic. Not open pollination. Um, and thanks for bringing it up to just to be clear. Right now, the plan is to control pollination within the GCOs. So use the same techniques you saw with us. I mean, we, you, you and I participated literally uh, going up in the lift and putting on the, the pollination bags. So okay. that'll be, in fact, that's the only allowable, again, back to the USDA permitting process. That's the only um, allowable way we can pollinate. And it's, it's a good way because it allows us to know exactly what the lineage is. We know who the mom okay. is, and we know that's the, the tree, the, the, the tree in the GCO, and we know the dad because we have those records of, of the pollination source. So that's what we're doing now. Um, 
down the road, obviously, we have the same conversation a couple of years from now, it's going to be um, very different, especially if, you know, deregulation happens. And um, okay. great. That's, that's an Thank you. Answer. Thank you. Well, Other comments and questions, please. One, com one comment I would make is, is that I, I always like the uh, security given by the fact that if we extrapolate to a day in the future when we're able to release uh, an American chestnut tree with a transgenic gene into the wild, every time that tree crosses with a wild American chestnut, 50% of the offspring will not have the gene. So there will always be a full genomic complement of wild trees still in existence. The, the genetically changed tree will still allow the pure wild genome to exist. And, and that's a great safety factor into the future, I think. Right. We come, Chip in if you have a question, we're now down to um, uh, 35 minutes uh, before the board meeting starts. So I wanna make sure there's time for people to have a lunch break if they want it. That's, Now's the time to do that, and I'm going to go do that. Anybody's welcome to keep the audio on and go make a sandwich or whatever. Exactly. Don't feel free to have have your snack or lunch while we continue any conversation that, want, that people want to continue to continue to have. Kendra makes a good point in the chat that um, the Phytophthora root rot that, um, for example, Joe James has been able to identify in South Carolina. Um, comes from the, the Chinese lineage. And so that's part of what is going on in terms of finding saplings that, that have inherited that Phytophthora root rot resistance um, from the Chinese uh, lineage and then crossing them with the transgenic uh, pollen. And that'll be going on this summer um, down in South Carolina. So that's, that's, an, that's another Obviously, we New Englanders, I, I, I speak for myself, <coughs> with as many problems as we have that I think you got out of my conversation or my uh, presentation, <clears throat> we don't have Phytophthora root rot yet. <laughs> so it's nice not to have to think about it. But our friends down in the Southeast do have that major, major additional um, deadly disease. And so um, be able to send some, some, some uh, blight tolerant pollen to them to help solve that problem, which eventually into the future, decades into the future is predicted to be also a New England problem, um, is a great thing to, to work on right now and try to move forward. And correct, isn't it, that the uh, root rot is also an invasive from, uh, from Asia? Yes, and it's been around even longer. Um, let's see, Brian, did you have a follow-up or your, your hand is just raised from before probably? Uh, no, I had another question. Uh, okay. Okay. Just on the earlier comment about 50% of crosses, uh, wondering about the homozygous, heterozygous situation here. I assume that the, the, the trees you're growing, uh, transgender trees you're growing are homozygous, but, uh, and I would assume then that the crosses are hetero, the ones that do inherit the gene are then heterozygous. So. Their, their crosses with with natives will only have 25 percent that are that are resistant well our our um, seedlings one half of the chromosome has the gene the other half doesn't have the gene so when I showed you that picture of pollen and the testing of pollen those pollen grains half of those pollen grains have the gene half of those pollen grains do not have the gene have not inherited the gene Okay, so that's the, that's what produces the slightly less than fifty percent in the field. Depends on which pollen grain uh, fertilizes the female flower. Is it the one that has the gene or not? Um, it's a little bit less than fifty percent because of various factors, like well, mainly um, inadvertent open pollination. So uh, that's the sorry. answer. To that. So they're not homozygous. Okay. Yeah, and then I, and that circles back to the Doug's really important point that you're always going to have this seedbed, if you want to call it, of wild trees produced by the transgenic approach. 
because half of what you produce is going to have um, nothing but 100% American genes, but it won't be able to withstand the blight. Um, so half, half, half of that, half pure American, 100%, but blight prone, half having all the American genes, 35,000 genes, plus the one additional one. So that's, I think, one really important result of this. Let's, let's uh, add, uh, Craig, Craig Falls wanted to ask something and make a comment. Oh yeah, real quickly, I was just kind of wondering what you think the, the bottleneck might be in terms of, um, you know, let's assume we get deregulation. Now we're trying to repopulate, um, you know, both in terms of just numbers and genetic diversity, what, what should we be focusing on um, to try to make that happen as quickly as we can? Yeah, I mean, deregulation is what we're waiting for, but I think as you, can see by the presentation, we're really busy in the process, not sitting on our hands by any stretch of imagination. Um, once deregulation happens, I think it's just a kind of a natural extension of what we're doing. So people are always emailing me about, well, how do I, how do we get a tree that won't die? I would love a tree that wouldn't die. Um, and, you know, they, or they would like to breed their own front yard tree. So with deregulation, I, I could send the vial of pollen out to someone um, that's not under permitting. Right now, I can only send it to places that have um, the USDA permitting that's allowed, very few. It's you know, an ordeal. It's very carefully, very, very carefully monitored. It's important to note, USDA is really, really precise about keeping track of what is allowed, who has what in the permitting process. And they, they keep really good records. Um, so, so it's severely constrained in terms of locations and, and procedures. Um, right. And I mean, in the meantime, it is, it, is it really the mother orchards that are going to, you know, benefit the efforts the, the most? You know, like before we get deregulation, yeah. what, what's, what's sort of like the most important things we can do to increase the genetic I, diversity. I think the trajectory I described is what we will continue to do this year, certainly next year, very unlikely to have deregulation by, ne by, by the next summer, maybe by the summer of 2023. Some people that know a lot more about it and are much more in the inside circle than I am, that could happen. But I think we just continue to do the diversification and increasing quantity that we're doing now. Um, Jared Westbrook, again, very, very carefully, very thoroughly guiding this process along with the people at ESF. Jared's been talking about how, is there a way to industrialize the testing process? Not to put a uh, curtain care a lot of work, but he's thinking, you know, if we're, if we're gonna, what's gonna be happening when we have 50,000 nuts we need to test and compared to 1,500 or 5,000 we had last year, which was a lot of work, many, many hours of work. As, uh, as Kurt and Doug and Brian and many others that helped out last year can, can vouch for. Um, you know, can we induct, in other words, is there a machine that could cut a piece of the cotyledon off and drop it into a, a little test tube? And, and so, so we're thinking about those kinds of scaling up efforts in, uh, while, we're, while we're constrained. But you know, once there's deregulation, the GCOs will be in full bloom. So there's going to be tremendous genetic diversity represented there to, to pollinate with. There'll be more mother trees out across the native range that could be pollinated. Um, and there'll be many people looking for not either either transgenic pollen to use themselves or, or seedlings. So the, the picture I showed you of that greenhouse full of 500 seedlings, those are going to be the ones that we can then send out. And, and you know, replant again. The private landowners are going to be crucial. Um, all all landowners, whether they're land trusts or uh, are all going to be interested in in this. And that that's the only way we're going to make uh, restoration happen through through a partnership of all types of of landowning organizations. If if Kendra, I don't know if she's still here, and she'll correct me because my numbers are going to be way off. But it was an amazing figure she put out recently in order to come close to restoring the number of uh, death nuts that were lost in the first 30, 40 years of the chestnut blight, we would have to plant 
chime in if you have the number, but we would have to plant many millions every year for a decade or two. It was that, it, it was an- Yeah, it was um, it's for a century or two. <laughs> And, and so Sarah, um, Doug, Sarah Fitzsimmons did some sort of extrapolation based on current hardwood planting practices um, in terms of the number of hardwood seedlings that are produced and outplanted across, you know, within the U.S. on a yearly basis. You know, most of the seedling production and planting that happens on an industrial scale is actually softwood production. Um, so based on what we do for hardwoods currently, uh, I think it's about, we need to plant like 2 million trees a year for 200 years to <laughs> there make you an go. ecological impact. That and right now on a good year, we plant about 30,000. So, you know, we're, we're making a drop in the bucket at this point in terms of outplanting. But, you know, to, to Craig's question, you know, we really need that, that diverse genetic base before we get to that sort of Johnny Chestnut seed stage of wanting to flood the forest with trees, um, you know, there's always like kind of a balance of doing a little bit about planting while you're still fixing everything. But um, it's really gonna be once we get seed production orchards into open pollination that we can really ramp up production. I mean, we, we've looked at our production from our back cross breeding and hand pollinating is not, is not very efficient. <laughs> the trees are much better at doing it on their own. So. Once we can get production orchards with homozygous transgenic trees that are breeding true for transgenic offspring, that's when we're really going to get to the point of being able to put a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. I hope yeah, that makes sense. And then following up with that thought to Craig, what can we do now? And it would be what you just suggested, which is to, to increase the diversity of wild trees in our GCO. So Anybody and everybody can help track down leads. It's not easy finding, number one, a, a pure American chestnut in the woods, and number two, finding two close enough that they're open pollinating or spending the time to hand pollinate them and get those into a GCO so they can be pollinated without having to, when, when we work over at Tom's, I get up in the morning, drive to Portland, hope that the lift is available, drag it down to Cape Elizabeth, see if we can back it into the woods without getting it stuck on a stump. And if we can get these trees flowering in a GCO that are only 10 to 15 feet high that we can get to with an orchard ladder, it's a, it's a huge advantage. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so thanks for those comments, Kendra. Those are really useful kind of where we're headed steps um, so one of the one of the discussions about this common garden experiment that we're doing here in Maine in ESF and, and at uh, TACF is down the road as these as these transgenic seedlings um, become mature and that could happen as soon as four years based on what we've seen so far four or five years so they can begin to pollinate each other so that's that's thinking about the common garden experiment site as a as a nursery. And let them pollinate each other uh, would be, be given. Don't forget the, the the representation in the common garden experiment orchard is very is 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 throughout the native range. Obviously, we need to continue to diversify, but it's it's got it's got um, representation for Virginia and Indiana and all these different places, Vermont. So so that would be um, something that coming down the road is going to be a, a, a plus in terms of production of, of genetically diversified um, uh, uh, seeds that, that, have the, that inherit the wheat gene. Other comments, questions? Uh, board, board members from our, our chapter, are you comfortable with waiting until 12 to start the board session or should we do it sooner? Okay, not hearing anything. We will wait till 12. So once again, anyone who wants to stay on with Tom and ask questions, I, I do want to take this chance while we're all here to, to thank you in unison for a, a wonderful summary of a big topic. And um, we'll be listening during lunch. Thank, thanks a lot. It was great to 
get this opportunity to share the progress over the last couple of years. And it's, they're very much a team, team effort. So- Will Abbott uh, and uh, uh, Ian have their hand up, I think, maybe not. Or maybe they were clapping, it's hard to tell. <laughs> clapping, yeah. And, and so just to, to reiterate that there's volunteer efforts are very much needed and appreciated. So uh, Doug, Doug is gonna be available to communicate with in terms of if people that have an op, uh, uh, opportunity to help out in various ways in the next few months. So please get in touch with Doug and Doug will be sending out um, requests as well. But if you, if you have time and interest, um, let him know so, we, so that um, we can um, incorporate your, your contributions. It's, it's a big, big part of the success. Brian, Brian Clark. Yeah, just to... Quick logistics question: Is a, is there going to be a link made available to this recording? Yes. yes I, we, don't uh, see, I don't see any other board members from Massachusetts here. I think we had kind of short short notice. I wasn't aware of this till early this morning. I'd like to get some of the other board members to listen to this. With with, with luck, this is being recorded. I can't guarantee it, but that's what it says. So yeah, yeah. we will so make that available. Okay, it's getting recorded to the cloud or to somebody's computer. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Whose Zoom session is this? Is this Kendra's or? or uh, no, it's, it's mine, but as a kind of an amateur, we did start it uh, on the computer and tried to change it to the cloud. And whether that took, we're not sure, but it says it is recording. So we ought to be able to get to a link. Okay, great, thanks. Yes, thank you, uh, Tom. This was a great presentation. And um, it was me who spread the word this morning. I'm sorry for the late notice, Brian, that uh, you didn't know sooner. But uh, I was prompted by Brian McLean to get the word out. And so I did the best I could. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, always happy to help out. And yeah, Mark, you know, again, to my two sides of this, uh, the chestnut burr, you're you and, and Dave Lent are the masters on the finding the wild tree. So uh, we're going to keep it up. People that I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Part of it is just you guys are great at finding them, and part of it just seems to be that Massachusetts has a relatively both both yeah. reasons. And so uh, yeah, so you you need you you thank you for that direct um, contributions that you're making in terms of the the nuts, and they're doing really well in my greenhouse, by the way. Uh, as they always are, because you're 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 great at um, uh, the processing of, of them and sending them and keeping them happy in the winter, but um, but yeah, any um, further advice along the way that you and Dave can share and how we can replicate what you guys do in other locales? Um, it's 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 amazing how you keep every year you find new sources that we didn't know existed before. And it's abs just it's absolutely crucial, fundamental to the restoration effort. So mm -hmm. we need to really thank you for, for you and Dave for doing all that work. It's been a pleasure. It has been work, but uh, we will stay at it. And every year we increase the number of nuts in the harvest. And this year I got 5,000 of them out there. They went all over New England. Uh, they went to uh, a, a, uh, TACF sales, and we had some go for research purposes out to, to Michigan. So we're dealing in quantities of uh, thousands of nuts, and we hope and to it, double the number for next year. It, you know, in the GCOs, as we're watching them over the years, you know, you see a lot of variation. We talk, Oh, there is. Before. There is a some lot of variation. Five, some don't, some mature faster. Yep. Others yeah. just um, are just notice the same thing. Climatic yeah. differences differ, the soil differences. So that's another real reason why the GCOs are important because mm -hmm. the site diversity is there as yeah. well. So Mark's nuts yeah. that he's been sending around, they're they're planted extensively throughout Maine and, and in other states. So yeah. um, you know, and we're finally getting them in Massachusetts. They're coming home to Massachusetts soon. So. Yeah. Thanks to Brian and, and also a new GCO will be starting in, in, on Flint Field this Climatically, year. Climatically, we're not all that different from you here in Southern Maine, to be honest. So, uh, so they're well represented in Southern Maine. Great. 
Well, I'm checking out and goodbye and hope to see everybody yeah, again. Great. Thank so, you for all you do. Thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, it was great. great. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, are we, are, is anybody, we have anything else to say? Some kind words were expressed in the chat. Um, anything else people want to add before we sign off? I think we're okay. ready to move on then. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to my grading and other deadlines I have here. <laughs> uh, but thanks for the for this opportunity, Doug. It was uh, it was great to interact with you. It also was nice to put together the slides of of the blur that has been the last two years of all the work we've done. It's been it's useful to just kind of reflect on all that we've been able to. I would say systematically accomplished. I'm not sure we were always so systematic about it, but it ended up being good steps forward along the way to, to, to make progress. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's been really helpful for me to, to have this opportunity to, to present our transgenic journey. Well, we're gonna see plenty of you, I'm sure, over, the, over this planting season to help get the fence up and help get the seedlings in the ground and help to harvest them and then help to test them afterwards. So we'll be busy. Yeah, so please get in touch with Doug if you'd wanna help out in any way, shape or form. And, um, and uh, we, could, we could always use it. It's really valuable and it's, and it's fun, it's fun. <laughs>